What do you say? I think we should go with it. Right? Well, welcome everybody, town board members, uh, our presenters tonight, and uh, I'm glad to see so many citizens have shown up. I'm Tom Flaherty, I'm the Webster Town Supervisor. Um, and tonight, we are going to be doing a workshop presentation on uh, 600 Ridge Road uh, and the Webster, uh, West Webster Hamlet in general. Um, a couple things. Uh, tonight's presentation, um, we kind of envision as being the first of a series of presentations. Uh, I'm hoping that within the next couple of months as we get more information, uh, we're going to be able to have uh, a meeting where the public can take the podium or take the microphone to ask questions and we're hoping to assemble a panel of experts that can answer those questions. I think that uh, as this presentation goes on tonight from our presenters, um, I think the one thing that everybody should keep in mind is that the reason why that property looked the way it was for the last 15 years is unknown environmental issues. Those are the three words that have kept that property like this. And I want to set expectations. We know more today than we knew a year ago based on the phase two environmental testing. But we still have a lot more pieces uh, to the puzzle to figure out as the graphics show. At the end of the presentation, uh, as town board workshops are, if the town board members have questions or comments, uh, they certainly can ask them of the presenters. Um, all the reports, uh, actually, what you're going to see tonight is basically an attempt to distill down a 400 plus page, very technical scientific report so that people such as myself, who are not scientists, which probably most of the public isn't, so they can understand it and relate to what those findings show on the site. Um, in anticipation of our next meeting, uh, there will be a portal open on the town website so that citizens can uh, submit comments and questions. Um, and like I said, I think the next meeting will certainly have a public uh, interaction component. The agenda for tonight is really uh, threefold. Josh Artuzo, our Director of Community Development, will give a short presentation on the history of 600 Ridge Road. And then Mary Harrington, our town engineer, is going to get into the meat and potatoes of this. Uh, as I, and that is really the phase two environmental and structural report findings. Um, Mary's part of the presentation, both the time that will be spent at the podium and the number of slides that are gone over will be the majority of Mary's. That's the main act. That's why I think people came is to find out about the, the environmental. And then we'll culminate with uh, Matt Chatfield, who is the executive director of the Webster Economic Development Alliance, just giving an update about the multi-pronged different strategies and efforts that are going on uh, in the West Webster Hamlet, which is somewhat centered by the linchpin property of 600 Ridge. So without further ado, I am going to bring up Josh Artuzo, our community development director, to describe the history of the trail. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. So believe it or not, you're actually looking at some historic photos of 600 Ridge Road. Um, as many of you may know, prior to 1980, uh, this site was home to various commercial and retail operations. Uh, there was once a meat market, a plumbing supply store, a pizza parlor, and most recently the Webster Furniture Strippers. So the property consists, it's just under two tenths of an acre parcel located at the northwest corner of Ridge and Gravel Roads. There are two existing structures on the site. Uh, the primary structure is a little over 3,000 square feet. It's a two-story wood frame building. And there's also a 704 square foot detached garage. 
Uh, the current zoning of this area is LC1, Low Intensity Neighborhood Commercial. So I'm just going to go over a brief uh, history of the property tax and ownership from about 2006 until the present. So back in 2006, uh, the Webster Furniture Strippers business closed abruptly and the property was essentially abandoned by the owner. Around 2009, Monroe County initiated the tax foreclosure process due to several years of unpaid taxes. Now there were no bidders at that auction, primarily due to the, the unknown environmental concerns. So the county opted not to take title to the property due to those unknown concerns. So actually the property reverted back to the private owner at that time. And that cycle has continued for approximately an additional 10 to 12 years, um, annually going up for auction, not having any bidders, and the county deciding not to take ownership of the property due to the unknown environmental concerns. So it has been a crazy cycle that has repeated itself. And essentially, uh, the, the unpaid tax bill has continued to accumulate, and there is approximately $134,000 of unpaid property taxes. Um, and it is important to note that the property is under private ownership. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mary Harrington, the town engineer, and she's going to uh, give a brief summary of the phase two environmental site assessment and the structural report. Thanks, Josh. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to go over the long scientific report that we received from Day Engineering and a structural report as well on the buildings. I want to start out with why there is this idea that there are environmental concerns at the site. So in the um, timeline of 1991 to 1993, the neighboring property alerted the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation of perceived operational violations. And then following that notification, the New York State DEC, Monroe County Department of Health, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, otherwise known as the EPA, performed site visits, documented findings, and found violations. One such violation was an air emission test um, that the site was required to have a permit for the chemicals being used, and it was tested at nine times the permissible limit. There was um, an area where I didn't have information on between 93 and 2000, but again in 2000, um, the business remained non-compliant with air emission permitting from New York State DEC. The DEC started a legal case against the business. The town supervisor at the time, Catherine Thomas, wrote a letter to the New York State DEC compelling them to proceed with legal action to force the business into compliance. With no action taken by the owner, the business continued to operate without permits or proper air control. And then, as Josh mentioned, in 2006, the business abruptly closed and the property was abandoned. So the phase two report itself is a complicated matter, but how did we get to um, the, the ability to have uh, a consultant on the site and actually occupy the site and take uh, soil samples, air samples, and things of that nature. Um, in April of 2020, the town coordinated with the county and had a meeting in an effort to strategize how this property could achieve redevelopment. In August of 2020, the town foiled DEC for environmental records, so that was summarized on the previous slide. In January of 21, Town officials met with Logier Environmental Consulting Group, a local um, consulting uh, uh, firm in the area, to discuss how to complete a phase one and a phase two testing report at the site. 
Because the property was still under private ownership, the town was able to obtain access by that private owner and enter the building to see if it was safe enough for this report to be completed. It was deemed safe to enter. In March of 21, at a town board workshop, Logier presented a proposal to complete phase one and two testing. But discussion by the board determined that it was not prudent to place the town in a position of liability should environmental testing results manifest an expensive and immediate remediation on a privately owned property. In May of 2021, the property exchanged hands and the town has attempted to contact the new owner with no response. Um, in November of 2021 and through May of 2022, town and county legal counsels discussed how to file a motion for temporary control of the site through the Supreme Court. In October of last year, a judge granted temporary control to Monroe County, not the town. A phase two environmental site assessment contract was executed with the county's consultant, Day Engineering, which the town reimbursed the county in full for. Over the course of November of last year through March of this year, the field investigation was completed, a report was completed, and the town and county reviewed its contents. Once the report was submitted to the judge, it ended the county's access to the property. So what is an environmental site ass assessment? There's three different types. A phase one is non-intrusive, comprehensive examination to recognize, um, to identify recognized environmental conditions, also known as RECs. It does not confirm the presence or absence of contamination, rather it assesses the potential for contamination. A phase two is conducted typically after a phase one, the purpose is to, de to determine if there is actual contamination present, but it does not quantify the extent of the contamination. Typically, during a phase two, soil vapor testing, drilling or excavating to collect samples of soil and groundwater, and testing for hazardous materials occurs. A phase three is more comprehensive than a phase two, and typically involves more sampling, analysis, and reporting to the point where you can determine the nature and extent of contamination at a property and develop a remediation plan to clean up any contamination. What the town had completed was a phase two. So during the phase two, the following fieldwork was completed. Surface soil evaluation, subsurface sub soil evaluation, monitoring well sampling, sub-slab vapor screening, a drain evaluation, of a, a building materials survey and a structural assessment. Day Engineering completed the first part. Watts Architecture and Engineering completed the building materials survey. And Jay Scrafeff Engineering completed the structural assessment. Before we move on, I wanted to clarify what some of the terms being used mean. So the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation has determined what level of contamination is allowable based on the property use. An unrestricted use, land may be used and developed without any imposed environmental restrictions. This is, um, for example, an agricultural use. A residential use is a category which allows a site to be used for any other use other than grazing, grazing livestock or producing animal products for human consumption. For example, single family housing. Commercial use, land may be used only for the purpose of buying, selling, or trading of merchandise or services. Limited redevelopment without remediation. For example, a retail store or a service provider. And then soil cleanup objectives, also known as SCOs. The level of contamination allowable based on the proposed use of land so for each of these different types of uses, we're focusing tonight on unrestricted or commercial. There is a soil cleanup objective, which is a threshold of how much contamination could be there um, to use the land in that function. So I know the map is a little bit challenging um, to read, but hopefully when you get home later this week, um, you can look at the slide. 
slideshow. But I'm going to start with the soil evaluation. So this was a combination of real-time VOC monitoring, volatile organic compounds, and then laboratory an analytical of soil samples that tested for VOCs, SVOCs, semi-volatile organic compounds, metals, and PCBs. Um, the map to the right, when you do have a chance to look at it closer, um, identifies different areas where soil testing was completed on the site. So, um, and then I gave a little legend for what the different notations mean at the bottom. So when they looked at the soil in the field, they used a piece of equipment to um, get real-time readings on the level of uh, VOCs that were detected in the air. So a helpful definition is parts per billion is PPB and parts per million is PPM. So they'll be referenced on uh, subsequent slides. As a result, the main building basement read no evidence of VOCs. And the exterior um, at SS1, as indicated on the map, which is located between the main building and the garage, VOC rate ranged from zero to 76 parts per billion. At location SS2, surface soil two, north of the garage, VOCs ranged from 29 to 5,160 parts per billion. To put this in perspective, a low level alarm on the piece of equipment shown on the previous slide is 10,000 parts per billion, and a high level alarm is 25,000 parts per billion. So the surface readings of the soil were both far below either the low or the high alarm. So walking past the site or within the site, you wouldn't be exposed to a VOC vapor reading that would be alarming to this industry. Also taken were VOC readings as they took the soil out of the ground. So when they completed bores, they took soil samples where there was staining or other indication of contamination. I want you to note the depth of these locations of the soil tests. There are readings that are higher than the high level alarm that were taken at the site as they extracted the soil from the earth. Specifically, TB3 was taken at a depth of 19 feet. So this isn't anything that you'd be exposed to walking by the property, however it was found deep in the ground. Similarly, TB6 was found to be over the limit, and that again was at 15.5 feet deep. To put this into perspective in another way, if you were to open a Sharpie, nail polish remover, or be near gasoline, you'd be exposed to over 500 parts per million of VOCs. So while it is um, obviously not good to have 492 VOCs come out of the earth, we are exposed to these VOCs in day-to-day -day life, but just not at a constant, um, well, hopefully not constantly. So now I'm gonna go into what was tested at the lab when they collected these soil samples. When they tested four VOCs in the actual soil, there was only one sample from inside the garage that detected the VOC methylene chloride exceeding the unrestricted SCO. So as I mentioned before, the unrestricted SCO would be if the land was used for single family use. However, it is much lower than the commercial threshold for this uh, organic compound, which is 500 parts per million. When testing for SVOCs, these are semi-volatile organic compounds. Some examples are formaldehyde, acetone, ether, or DDT. No samples tested were detected concentrations greater than the unrestricted SCO. They tested for metals in samples. One metal that was detected that exceeded the thresholds was lead. Three samples detected elevated levels. Two exceeded the unrestricted SCO. One at a depth of four to six feet, another at a depth of two to four feet. A third exceeded the commercial SCO. 
at a depth of zero to six inches. So if, you, um, if the site were to be used for something um, commercial or unrestricted, these contaminants were located anywhere from six inches to six feet down. Mercury was also detected. It was only elevated above the unrestricted SCO, and it was at a depth of six feet or less. The final test to the soils were for PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, which is a man-made organic compound which has been banned since 1979 and has been used in um, materials such as Teflon. One sample from inside the garage tested positive and it was located at a depth of four to six feet. In summary, soil testing identified contaminants to a depth of six feet. There were soil tests um, taken on soils that were deeper in the earth um, where there was staining, but they did not come back with anything above the unrestricted SCO. All of them were below the commercial SCO concentration, apart from lead, in a surface sample that was less than six inches from the surface. Monitoring wells were installed in three of the test bores with the intention of collecting water samples from three locations. This was to both test for contaminants and triangulate groundwater flow patterns to determine what may be entering or leaving the site. In November of 2022, monitoring well one, which was 17.3 feet deep, encountered groundwater. Petroleum-based VOC compounds and lead were detected, exceeding New York State DEC concentration guidance. Monitoring well 2, 16.3 feet deep, and monitoring well 3, 16 feet deep, did not encounter water, so sampling was not able to be had. In January of 2023, with snow melt, we thought that maybe the groundwater table had risen and maybe we'd have more success in our sampling. We went back and had monitoring well one sampled again. And again, petroleum-based VOC compounds were detected and exceeded New York State DEC concentration guidance. Monitoring well two encountered groundwater this time and no contaminants were detected. Monitoring well three, again, did not encounter water and the depth of these wells was limited due to the encountering of bedrock. So if um, wells were installed at a deeper, uh, deeper depth, it would take a more powerful piece of equipment to get through the bedrock. Subslab vapor screening was completed. So this is where you take a piece of a slab and you see what vapors have come up through the soils beneath that slab. So one sample was taken under the building basement slab. No constituents detected at concentrations greater than air guidance and or 90th percentile of New York State DOH guidance, which are the two standard guidances in this industry. Two samples were taken under the garage floor. Six constituents detected at concentrations greater than these two guidances. Methylene chloride, which is a paint stripper, acetone, a paint remover, carbon disulfide, which softens paints and varnishes, chloroform, a solvent for lacquers, polish, and resin, hexane, a solvent and cleaning agent, and toline, which is used in the manufacturing of paint and liqueurs. So these all make sense for why they were in that garage. A drain evaluation was completed there was a drain in the garage and a drain in the building basement that were attempted to be traced. The garage drain was clogged and was unsuccessful in tracing. The basement drain was successfully traced to a sanitary manhole nearby, which means it isn't entering the, the natural waterways and is going to the treatment plant for treatment should anything have ever been put down that drain. A material survey was conducted inside the buildings. Asbestos was tested for, and much of the pipe insulation, flooring, mastics, glazings, and caulks were found to contain asbestos 
as is uh, predictable in a building of this age. Lead-based paint, again, tested positive in many areas because of the age. And PCBs were tested. No items detected levels exceeding 50 parts per million and therefore would not require special handling and disposal. A structural assessment was completed. Um, these are photos from inside the building recently. Uh, the main building is structurally sound. It requires repair and replacement of components, but is very salvageable. And the garage is recommended for demolition. So the next steps. In Day Engineering's report, they recommended installation of a vapor mitigation system, similar to a household radon system, that would um, help treat any vapors that came up through the, the subsurface. Installation of additional monitoring wells to triangulate the groundwater movement. Character characterization of fill samples. Additional materials testing for asbestos and lead paint. And developing a remediation and or site mitigation plan. Challenges to complete this today. It's under private ownership and the county's temporary court ordered control has expired. So I would also say that completing a phase one ESA is recommended. Typically a phase one comes before a phase two, but because of the DEC documents obtained by the town, there was reasonable information to go right to a phase two. However, a phase one would review the neighboring properties and any potential impacts that they may have had to 600 Ridge Road. It is believed that a gas station dispensing petroleum products and leaded gasoline may have existed on the property to the west, perhaps explaining some of the results of the testing. The um, petroleum and lead that was encountered was very deep in the ground. The VOCs that were read were from samples very deep in the ground near the water table. And typically how contaminants move from one site to another is it migrates down through the soils to the water table and then moves through the water table to wherever it's flowing. So it's possible that some of the things encountered at 600 Ridge Road did not start at 600 Ridge Road. Also recommended is completing a phase three environmental site assessment. This would quantify the extent of the impact to the site and develop a plan for remediation and would incorporate day engineering's recommendations. Again, the challenge to complete this now is that it is privately owned and the county's temporary court order control has expired. I'm glad to see you're all still awake. <laughs> Um, I know it's a little bit technical, but I'm going to pass it over to Matt Chatfield for the Hamlet Revitalization Update. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I'd like to commend Mary for taking a four, three to four hundred page document and distilling it down to about 25 slides that most people can uh, be able to understand, so that was quite an effort. As you know, there's been multiple levels of investigation and activity taking place in the West Webster Hamlet. Um, our efforts at 600 Ridge are at the epicenter of the Hamlet itself, but there's multiple layers of initiatives currently taking place. So the Hamlet Master Plan and additional property rehabilitation efforts are taking place simultaneously to the efforts that the town is undertaking at 600 Ridge. So for those of you who are familiar, it's very, it's, this should be uh, not new to you, but in 2021, the town was awarded $90,000 to help develop a master plan for the Hamlet. So taking a bigger step back, right, a more global perspective on how can we revitalize this part of our community. And that planning study should be complete here in the next month or so. And the final recommendations were uh, on display uh, a few weeks back at a public open that took place in Finn Park. So the results of that will be made available. And the goal of this effort is to identify recommendations moving forward for not just 600 Ridge, but all the properties surrounding it, and then build momentum. And of course, uh, put the town in a great position to apply for funding.
from state and federal partners. In addition, the town recently applied for about $1.8 million in direct funding for the rehabilitation of targeted properties within the hamlet. And there's four properties, including number one there, which is 600 Ridge. There's four properties in, in total uh, that surround the intersection of gravel and, and Old Ridge Road, and that's the epicenter of revitalization efforts in the hopes that uh, growth and investment will spread from there. And maybe some of you may be asking, well, why not to just demolish that old building? Why rehabilitate it? Well, there, there's good arguments potentially for either, either direction. The goal of rehabilitating the property is twofold. First of all, the urban form of that little hamlet with the four buildings, you know, each of the sides of the intersection being uh, bookended essentially by a structure, creates that sense of place that it is a viable little community, a village-like center. Tearing down a building and having that be open and vacant uh, would detract from potential revitalization efforts. Although it may help eliminate an eyesore immediately, in the long term it may actually be a detriment to the overall uh, growth and revitalization of the hamlet. Second of all, in order to redevelop that site, the site's just too small to be any sort of have any sort of viable redevelopment take place that could be funded uh, and ba make basically be bankable have a return on investment. So the existing structure has been identified for rehab. So the next steps for, in this bigger picture, Mary talked about the next steps for the, uh, the environmental side, but next steps for the overall revitalization. We need to identify what the environmental next steps are, right? So what additional information do we need for a remedial plan? Mary went over that phase one, phase three, um, so we know what those next steps are. In addition, Mary constantly related that the property is still privately owned. Right? The property owner is absentee. Um, they have not uh, been willful in, in their involvement in revitalizing the hamlet or investing in their property. So we need a, a path forward to identify a, a new owner or a new title holder of that property that will be a willing and viable partner in this effort. Assembling funding sources, the Webster Economic Development Alliance, that's where we come in, we apply for funding on behalf of the town at a, at a host of different levels, federal and state, so we're trying to assemble a funding package to bring uh, implementation to the front. And then in implementing the Hamlet Master Plan, we're thinking the first steps are going to be some streetscape improvements on Old Ridge Road and Gravel. Those are the, that's the first available funding source that would likely be uh, available in starting in October of this year. And then, obviously, continuing to encourage investment in, within the community by the existing property owners. And with that, we're actually going to open it up to any questions.
Jack too. I'm sorry. Uh, for all your works, and I want to thank you, everyone here that come and uh, to hear our presentation. It's a long time coming, and you know all the hard work really to pay off. And I thank you for all the patience that the community has given us, so that we can do about the the, the root works to help our community.
transpired in the last few months um, will maybe help us get to September, which is a little five months away, Charlie, where our continued efforts with the county um, might manifest who that next owner is, who is willing to go in and invest, and also what funding they can get to go in to rehabilitate and also to remediate whether that's going to be scraping six inches of soil or whether that's going to be more. We just don't know yet. But um, for anybody uh, in the audience or anybody watching this, if they've had huge concerns over the years, and some people have voiced to me they have, um, it, it is not as bad as I think some people had uh, made it out to be. Um, but it's certainly I don't want to minimize that. I'm sure that there is going to ultimately have to be some type of remediation uh, as that property moves forward. And I can't stress this enough, and Matt, you did a wonderful job uh, explaining all the parallel things going on for what is really a whole neighborhood revitalization. But I think we would all agree that you're really like perfuming the pig on neighborhood revitalization, revitalization if you don't hit on 600 Ridge. That's the linchpin. And unless that property is resolved, then the rest of that revitalization is really never going to, you know, uh, get traction. Because investors and private money, they're just not going to come in and put in a street of shops and all that stuff when that when that is uh, when that is sitting there. So I'll get off my soapbox. Um, and I really appreciate for the crowd that was here tonight um, being understanding of why we really we wanted a workshop setting. Uh, because even if you did ask a lot of questions, you want to really be frustrated, we'd be sitting here probably answering, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. Um, so I want to, you know, I just want to be very upfront with that. There is a lot we don't know right now, but there's a lot more we know than we did a year ago. And by the time we have our next follow-up meeting, so stay tuned. We're hoping that in a couple of months, we can get a panel of experts up here to answer Public's questions, you know, uh, whether that panel is someone from the New York State DEC or the federal EPA or the, the New York State or Monroe County Health Department, those are people that could probably answer the public's questions about this much better than, um, I hate to say it, than Mary, Josh, Matt, or myself, or anybody on this panel. That, that's not our expertise. So, um, give us some time to, to talk to those people and see if we can put together uh, something in a couple of months. With that, uh, I want to thank the presenters, I want to thank the board, I want to thank everybody who came, and that concludes our workshop. And be on the lookout, uh, it'll be on the website, I think, Karen, and on social media, the 400 page report from Day Engineering. If you haven't signed yet, try to read that. Uh, but also, there's approximately 30 page um, PowerPoint will be there. Certainly, as Mary said on your own screen, or printing out the map that's up there, and I think it'll be easier for you to follow. And by all means, take advantage before the next meeting of sending us questions and comments. The more public questions and comments before the next meeting, the better we're prepared to have a meeting that answers those for you. Thank you.